Good morning. Welcome to the Methodist Church. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Whether you are here in the courtyard with us or at home online, we know you had a choice and we are blessed to have you with us. We hope that you will continue to join us each and every Sunday and we invite you to join us in our mission, Growing Disciples and Loving Our Community for Christ. I hope you will help us with our attendance as part of our tracking records. We need to know who was here. And it helps me also just to know if you're out there at home, if you are also joining in, will you take out your cell phones and text the word here to 559 657 6848. For those joining for the first time, instead of using the word here, you can text live to be able to get and receive online worship reminders and updates. In this time of uh, uncertainties and uh, often changing rules, we try to keep you updated as to when and how we are able to gather together and worship our God together. So let me repeat that number one more time. If it's your very first time, you're gonna text the word live. If you have been joining us um, throughout this um, pandemic closure or have been longtime members, it'll be the word here. That number is 559-657-6848. Just text the word here. If you would like to support our ministries by giving, we have several options for your convenience. For online giving, just visit our website at visaliamethodist.org. Click the giving tab. Here in the courtyard, you may drop your offerings in the plates here in the front, or we have set up the iPads just inside the doors for those who prefer to give electronically. We thank you in advance for your generosity. Today, Pastor Steve begins a new sermon series. The recordings will be posted on our website, YouTube, and Facebook. Be sure to share it with your friends and family. And don't forget to hit like or and follow us on Facebook. And now, if you will stand wherever you are for the reading of God's word this morning. I'll be reading from Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. And now, if you will bow your heads and quiet your spirits and join me in prayer. O oh Lord, what is there to do for those who are hurting? What can be done when life feels unfair? How do we overcome our fears? Your word tells us to pray. God, today we pray for students of all ages who won't return to school this year, but instead must receive their education through distance learning. We pray for preschoolers who are too young to understand why they can't see their teachers and friends. We pray for the children who miss their safe spaces to play and their loving teachers who help them learn their foundations of learning that carry them throughout their lives. We pray for elementary students who will miss their classes and opportunities, for the children who thrive through being challenged, who depend upon school meals, who have learned to socialize and flourish, who are known deeply by their teachers and staff. We pray for the loss of shared experiences of childhood joy for every kickball and hula hoop left in the gym closet and not on the playground grass. For every back seat of a school bus not occupied by the fastest or boldest fifth grader and for the, all the siblings that won't be strolling home together, sharing about their day. We pray for every middle schooler who will miss their networks, who will lose the time to share the transformation from child to teen. 
We pray for all our young ones who spent last year finding themselves as musicians and athletes, gamers or socialites, scholars and more, and now feel stuck at home without a place to fully share who they want to be. We pray for every eighth grader who didn't get a chance to adjust to high school and walk around the school with their heads held high. We pray for every awkward dance left on the cafeteria floor, for every locker left undecorated, for every yearbook left unsigned. We pray for our high schoolers whose only answer to the daily battle of worth is the community of people who pick them up with their acts of care. We pray for each moment of self-reliance stripped back, for each young, moment of young, unrealistic love shunted, for each moment of triumph and tribulation avoided, and for the power of belonging being brought back into isolation at home. We pray for the loss of band competitions, football games, for winning shots not falling on the court or the applause not heard from stage. We pray for our schools, administrators, educators, and staff whose soul and passion is for their students. We pray for the call of our teachers to do their best for their students who feel helpless to complete the task as they learn new ways to educate from a distance and to reach their students through new technologies. Help teachers who are transitioning to online classes make good use of new technology and methods as they adapt lesson plans and schedules. We pray for the vulnerable, for families without options for childcare, for parents feeling ill-equipped, for students dependent on the structure of school in an otherwise chaotic life, for the children with special education needs who may not be included in broad stroke electronic expectations, for our meal dependent children who may not eat, for those without technology and internet that have been given unequal opportunity. We pray for those who have lost their refuge, their champions, their cheerleaders and friends. God, you are bigger than our doubts. You are stronger than our fears. And so today we say, we know you are present. But this hurts. Something that can be a right decision can still cut deep. Losing a school year hurts. God, shelter the vulnerable like Jesus cared for the lost and forgotten. Help those who are broken by what is happening. Help us to give people a chance and a hope. Help us to be the light in our community. Help us to be that hope. Help us to be your answer. We pray all these just as Jesus' disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. As your director of care ministries, one of the many um, outreach ministries that I am privileged to be involved in is Drop in the Bucket, and today is Drop in the Bucket Day. And the buckets are back. <laughs> I hope that you um, will have an opportunity to reach into your pockets and pocketbooks and just pull out your spare change. Um, your small bills and drop them in one of the silver buckets that are placed throughout the courtyard. For those of you who are at home, you can still give to Drop in the Bucket by just uh, going online and mentioning Drop in the Bucket in the memo section or the designated section on our giving tab. With those donations, we gather them together and we reach out into our community beyond our own church family and to the family that we call neighbors. 
This month, we helped an unusual number of families. All six have been negatively impacted by the coronavirus or other illnesses or quarantine closures. Your donations provided gifts to help with food and living expenses for the following families. A couple who both lost their jobs and were unable to return to work when the husband became very ill. A single mother unable to work due to physical limitations after multiple surgeries. A family of four, husband and father injured at work, initially lost his job, and then returned with limited hours. A single mother of three became ill and for several months was unable to work because of the COVID-19 restrictions. A woman lost her job due to the shutdowns and then contracted the coronavirus. A young woman unable to work due to several illnesses. We helped each one of these families to be able to buy food, to pay for shelter, and to continue on in hope. You see, drop in the bucket with God's grace is just a few coins, but those few coins can change a family's ability to get through life and make ends meet. The Methodist Church is loving our community for Christ. I thank you for your support and your prayers for this and other ministries that we share with those around us, our neighbors, our friends, and our family. Praise God.
will never leave let you down. Amen? Let's sing this together. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Oh God, you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Because you are so good, God. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You are good. goodness even in the storm amen he is so good to us he is so faithful to us and he will never leave us amen let's continue worshiping God because you know I, I I've been learning that God wants a dialogue with us he wants to not only hear our voices and, and, and stuff but he wants us to have relationship with him fellowship with him and he just wants us to just pour out our hearts to him. So who here would love to experience just being in the presence of God, amen? So let's just open our hearts more today, this morning, and let's just continue diving in deeper in his presence, amen? So let's just declare that God is our miracle maker, that he is always there for us, you know, he is never against us, you know? So let's, let's just give glory to his name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Oh 
the way for us, Jesus. Your love is unfailing, God. You are holy, you are holy, Lord, and is, and is, Lord Jesus, It is great to see all of you. I'm seeing some faces that I haven't seen for a very long time. Actually, just I'm seeing some foreheads that I haven't seen for a very long time. But it's great to see the foreheads. Glad that you are uh, joining us in worship. I have learned here to uh, actually enjoy outdoor worship uh, as much, if not more, than inside uh, worship. Um, for 15 years, I've been telling Californians when they had this happy idea to worship outside, it's hot, man. You can't do that. Um, that might tell you that I'm very seldom up and out before the heat sets in. Are we ready? Fuzzy and Verlene were our next door neighbors in Casper when I was a very small child. They married uh, when he was a senior in high school and she was a junior, not recommended. Uh, after they got married, they lived together for a year or so when Verlene had a talk with Fuzz and that talk consisted of this, you are going to go to church whether you want to or not. He didn't want to, but he did go to church. I think if anyone ever really needed to go to church, it was Fuzz at that stage in his life. The proof of that is not so much his behavior, it is that when he went to church and he heard what was possible as opposed to what was true in his life, he gave his life over to Christ. He got saved in a little Baptist church right there in Casper, Wyoming. After he was saved, Fuzzy and Verlene, Fuzzy and V is what we called them, they began to be interactive in our lives in ways that they hadn't been before. Verlene became a scub, uh, Cub Scout den leader for me and my buddies at school, and Fuzz was forever on a Saturday morning picking us up and taking us for wheeling or playing basketball or doing other things. They devoted themselves to us as if we were their family, and they frequently had us over to watch movies or to play games, giving mom some much-needed respite. They went from, uh, as next-door neighbors, not really being very in touch with us to being an integral part of our lives. They were normal and safe people in a difficult time at home. And it might sound kind of goofy, but a, a part of the story of my own life is I am really glad that Fuzz got saved and that Verlene made him go to church because his salvation ended up being one of the most important events in my life. And, and one of the best. I'm going to read to you from two different uh, gospel readings this morning, Matthew 5 and Mark 1. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Most of you will be familiar with it. This is Jesus uh, in the Beatitudes, and he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. And in Mark 1, 16 through 20, this is Jesus calling his uh, followers. 
As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets, and they did follow him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they also followed him. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of Scripture. Okay, let's change gears just a little bit. Here are some of the questions that I know are on the minds of the good folks from Visalia Methodist Church. Where do we go from here? What is going to happen if the church shutdown lasts through the rest of the year, or uh, though it's unimaginable, maybe even longer? How will the church recover if our attendance doesn't bounce back? What are we going to do if we can't be who we were before? Those kinds of questions uh, keep me awake at, at night and, and might be doing the same to you, whether it's about the church or whether it's about your own life. And the answer to every one of them is this. I don't know. <laughs> you'll, you'll remember I'm the genius when they shut us down that stood up front and, and, and said, well, we'll open up in a month and have a big potluck. It'll be a great time. Been a long, long month, hasn't it? I don't know. I, I give up trying to predict what's going to happen with the coronavirus, but I have actually enjoyed and prospered by studying on the questions that I asked, right? What is to become of us? How, how will we know what to do or how to be in the future when it is so very uncertain in so many areas? Well, here's the short answer that I've come up with. Whatever lies in the future, whatever the reality of how we have to be is, we're going to continue to be the church. Because the church never was a, a necessarily a place to meet or a time to meet or a set routine. The church is much more uh, uh, vivid and alive and different than those things. So we may never get back to what we were before coronavirus entered the picture, but we will still be the church. In fact, we've never quit being the church during the coronavirus. We've met as often as we possibly could, and when we couldn't, we've been on Facebook and met in spirit. Our small groups continue to meet. You all are doing an amazing job of reaching out to one another and keeping up on um, taking care of soul and uh, body and uh, spirit. So whatever lies ahead, friends, our intention is to be the church. In your personal life, I hope that you'll come up to the, the, the same answer. Whatever lies ahead for you, whatever coronavirus has done to your family structure or to your job or to your retirement, whatever lies out there, the only thing that is certain is if you're a follower of Christ, you should set your mind in whatever circumstance you're going to be in to continue to follow Christ. He might call you to be following him in a different way. You might be called to new service or, or different circumstances. But it, the beautiful thing about being a person of faith and having a relationship with God is that we full well know what we're going to be doing. We're going to be following God as he leads, whether it's in the church or in our homes or in our personal lives. Nothing anywhere can interfere with that unless we allow it to. So as scary as it is to think about what might be coming or, or what we might be losing or all those kinds of things, the, the answer truly and genuinely is, well, look, I've been trying my best to follow Jesus for most of my life since Fuzzy got saved and helped us out, and that's my intent. Whatever becomes of me and whatever becomes of the church is to figure out how to follow Jesus and then go after it with the same passion that we have for years and years and years. So that's the short answer. Of course, I wrote more than that, so I'm going to continue to preach because I spent all, all that time, and you might enjoy it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you might not too, but it's not that long. <laughs> so, in this time of discernment, I, I have been trying to pen a new church plan. And, and it's very difficult because you can't play by the old rules since, since you really don't know what's coming up. And, and in the church plan that I have been uh, thinking and praying and discerning about, I have come back to the, to the uh, basic question. What does it mean to be the church? What, what will become of us, right? How are we going to serve Christ in the future? What is the bedrock uh, idea of, of that? And, and we've got it in our mission statement. The, the idea of being the church together is, is relatively simple. We serve our community. We love our community for Christ in a lot of different ways. And, and we do great at that, right? We have all the care ministries. We have the food ministry. We do a very good job of caring for ourselves and caring for people in our community who are really up against it. The, we had to read 
fast through the drop in the bucket report this morning, but I want you to know, I know every one of those families that we helped last month, and, and this isn't, oh, the, an extra 10 bucks came in, right? This is significant help that set the ship back straight so that they could have hope that they'll be able to weather tremendous storms in their lives. We make a huge difference in a few lives, but it's a huge impact, and they know that the impact that's being made in their lives, in this case, uh, through uh, money, comes from the heart of people who follow Jesus. So we're offering not, not just aid for paying their rent and, and buying food, we are offering them a testament to what faith looks like when it's put into action. And, and I hope that you allow yourself to be happy about your church and about the fact that we serve our community in that way. Right? We don't just send a check off to somebody we've never seen before. We deal with the nitty gritty of people in our own community and we do so in a way that's really, really powerful. We'll never stop doing that never stop doing that. In whatever way we can aid and love our community on behalf of Christ, we will continue to because you can't really have a full faith unless you're acting it out in those ways. Even if what, the way you're acting it out is by contributing to drop in the bucket and knowing the church is going to find a, a recipient of it, it's a big deal to, to put your money where your faith is. So we will continue to do that. Now the second part of the equation it's a little more problematic, to be honest with you, uh, right? And one of the good things about coronavirus is it gives us all a, a chance as individuals and me as a pastor to, to think about, well, what, what could we improve? What could we either start doing that we haven't been doing or what could we uh, get better at? And, and the answer to that is that we could sure get a lot better at evangelizing. I don't want you to raise your hands because I'm going to ask a question that I hope makes most of you feel guilty. Um, please remember you love me before the question and I expect you'll love me after the question. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. How many of you have been instrumental one-on-one -on -one, in a person becoming a Christian in the last five years? Do not raise your hands. Just think about it. I'm guessing the percentage is going to be less than 5%. Maybe even lower than 5%. 4%. 3%. As a church, we had a pretty good run where we were bringing people in. Truthfully, most of those people came to us uh, through the care ministries or they transferred from other churches. They moved to Visalia for whatever reason or circumstances changed and, and they came to the church. And it's sometimes easy to look at small spurts of growth and think the church is doing great. We're doing exactly what we should be doing. But if you discern, are we actually making disciples? Are we bringing people who don't know Christ as their personal Savior into a relationship with Him? The answer is, well, if we are, it's done quietly and not very frequently, and we are really not very good at it, which is okay. Right? We get out of balance in the church just like you do in your personal life. Sometimes you're rocking and rolling at work, but home's not doing so good. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you're taking care of yourself physically and other things are getting set uh, to the side. So we need to address our ability to evangelize. Now, I'm thinking, uh, I will ask you to raise your, your hands to this question. How many of you, uh, if I asked you to today, would join me and we'd just go walk the neighborhood and knock on doors and ask people when they answered, uh, are you saved? One, two, three, yeah, okay. We're not going to do that. The rest of you can breathe a deep sigh. <laughs> because there are much more effective ways to bring people to Christ. Our problem as a church has been that we haven't been methodical and systematic in teaching those ways and in helping people as they pursue them. Let's go back to Fuzzy and Berlin. So Fuzzy got saved before they became uh, kind of integral in our family. And I don't know what happened, but it was a small Baptist church. And um, when the day for his baptism came up, he missed it. I don't know if he had to work or, or whatever, uh, but it was pretty traumatic for, for Fuzz. He began to ask my mom if uh, they could take us kids to church, and my mom said that was fine. And of us kids, I really was the only one who, who was really enamored of church. I've told you before, right, uh, my, uh, my brothers and sisters missed out. They, they did not equate church with cookies and hugs, but I did. Um, so I was always ready on a Sunday morning to, to go with Fuzz and, and Vita uh, to church. And, and they gave an altar call. 
uh, kind of the old-fashioned Southern Baptist uh, altar call. And I was a very young man, uh, seven years old at most. And I thought the preacher was talking to me, so I walked up to Center Island, and he asked if I wanted to give my life over Christ. I said yes. And that meant in that church you had to go to church Sunday evenings for two hours for six weeks in order to graduate your baptism class and then be baptized. Fuzz had already done that. But the day that I gave my life to Christ and they told me you have to come back tonight and start the classes, Fuzz sacrificed his own time away from his wife and he went to those classes again with me to make sure that I did everything that was necessary to be able to be baptized. On the day that we got baptized, uh, uh, Fuzz was in line ahead of me, and uh, so he got baptized first. And, and I will say, likely because of youth and innocence and, and just the, the special set of circumstances, I don't believe I've ever existed in a more holy framework or time in my life since then. To see Fuzz, who was tremendously important to me, give his life over and be baptized to, to allow himself to be taken into the pastor's hands and, and dumped uh, was just powerful and moving to me and it made my own baptism almost surreal. It was just an amazing time in my life to, to be able to, to give myself over to a, a power beyond myself. I am so thankful for Fuzzy and, and Verlene and, and for their interest in our family and for their helping me in the faith. Now that's one way to tell that story. Let me back up and tell it from a different perspective. Fuzzy and Verlene, when they began to go to church and became active in it, they were put into a class called evangelism. And in the evangelism class, here's what they learned. They learned that the best way to bring somebody to saving grace is to invest in their lives first. That equals go across the uh, driveway and talk to Mrs. Creel and see if it's okay to take the kids downtown for an ice cream cone or to have them over for a movie, right? To begin to invest uh, in uh, the life and, and uh, put your energy into friendship with another person is the best way to evangelize. So when they were taught how to win and influence people for Jesus Christ, they engaged in it. And years later when we talked, uh, Verlene would say that they were surprised that what seemed like it was gonna be an uphill climb and a big sacrifice was uh, as delightful as becoming a Christian in the first place. They intertwined their lives with us, they gained our trust and they earned our trust. And then when they took us to church, took me to church, the church was able to do its part of explaining the gospel in fullness and giving an opportunity to respond to it. The expectation was, of course, uh, that even as a child, having been baptized, that I would engage in that same kind of behavior. It's interesting to me, uh, in a kind of sad way, I did. As a little guy in grade school, I was inviting people to church all the time. Almost nobody, nobody came with me because I couldn't drive and pick them up. But I, I was really in on the, the whole idea of like, you should make a friend and, and bring a friend to Jesus. And somehow in my life as a pastor, especially here in Visalia, that part of what God calls us to do just got left behind. It wasn't that I ever rejected it, it was that I got busy doing other stuff, constructing uh, care ministries, trying to figure out what, which, uh, which problem in the church to solve or what the church should be doing next or whatever. And the emphasis began to change to other things. So during the coronavirus, I've had lots of time alone in my office. And in that time alone, as I pray and think about you, and think about us and, and think about the big questions of what comes next, the recurrent thought that I've had is, it is time for our church in its stage of health and, and, and exuberance and joy. And we really are a joyful church and we're very healthy. There's uh, no real toxic element in our church. It's time while we enjoy that season of life together for us to return to the basics of following Jesus. He said to his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. And it's time for us to return to that and to be intentional about it and to be intelligent about it and to be faithful about it. So we're going to be engaging in the same evangelism program that brought me to Jesus. Uh, and we'll do so systematically over uh, the next several years, I hope. Let me give you an acronym that you'll hear a lot about over the next weeks as we flesh out the different components. FISH. 
and that stands for friendship, initiating people to the spiritual, sharing your story, and then helping them finally to surrender themselves to Jesus Christ. Fish. Friendship, initiate to the spiritual, share your story, and help them surrender themselves to Christ. It's the oldest style of evangelism because it's the style of evangelism that Jesus himself used. He called the disciples to follow him. He befriended them. He talked in depth with them. He shared. He answered their questions. He proved himself to them, and that led them to a place where when the time came, they were able to surrender themselves to him. So going forward, we will talk about the four different components in, in the acronym of FISH, but what I will want and need from you is, is for you to really take this to heart. It's not just another program that the church will start and then forget. It really has to do with the essence of who we're supposed to be, and as individuals, when you evangelize, when you take it on yourself to teach by example and by word what it means to be a Christian to someone who isn't a Christian, what you actually do is you make a decision to grow in your faith and in your understanding and to deepen your own experience of God because you have to do that in order to be able to share with someone else. It calls for sacrifice of time and other things that you might want to be doing with your time, but it brings a reward that is amazingly rich and eternally lasting. So I haven't seen uh, Fuzzy or Verlene for a very, very long time. I imagine they aged a little bit. I, I certainly don't look the same as uh, when they were my best friends taking me to church. I may not see them until I cross over, until I'm in the spirit realm, right? But I promise, whenever I see them, it, it will be like a small child uh, for the first time understanding Christmas. I adore them. I adore them because they took a risk they invested in me and they introduced me to Christ who has become more and more the whole of my life as I've gone along. And, and as I contemplate who we're going to be in the future as we come out of uh, whatever this is and as I contemplate what I want to do with what's left of my life, I will tell you there is nothing more important than being able to put myself and you in a place where we can have the same effect on another generation. There are a lot of people in this time of coronavirus and, and, and uh, scary questions who do not have a relationship with Christ, and so they're relying on their own self, their own wisdom, and, and their own habits to figure out what to do next. We have a better answer than that, and we're going to pursue how to share that answer earnestly and honestly and in the spirit of Jesus Christ as best we can. I would like in the last quarter or whatever it is of my own life to have the privilege and let God grant me the privilege of being a fuzzy in somebody else's life so, so that they could say, my God, I am so glad Steve Creel got himself saved because that was a big deal in my life and I want the same thing for the church. So I would ask you this week to begin to pray earnestly and honestly, right? Uh, give me a heart for evangelism as we go through this program. Ask God to, to surround you with his spirit and, and to begin to, to uh, enter you in such a way that as we go through and talk about the components and, and how they get played out, you will have the courage to do what we're going to ask you to do. And, and not just the courage, but you'll find the energy and the spirit, the right-hearted uh, spirit to, to be able to do that. So the answer to the question, friends, what in the world is going to become of the Methodist Church when this stuff is all over is it's going to be better than ever before, more faithful, more diligent in pursuing what we've been called to do. And because of those things, what's going to happen to us is we will rejoice more earnestly and honestly than we ever have before. I promise. If you will come along, I'll lead us and let Jesus really and truly do the work for us. Let's bow our heads and pray, shall we? Father, today we are mindful of those who led us to Christ, of preachers who preached the gospel, of parents who took us to church, of friends who encouraged us, of those who went long before writing the record of Jesus in Scripture, and we are thankful for them, for everyone who forgot about themselves and served you, and in that service brought us to our saving grace, we give thanks and praise. And we ask, Father, that you would truly inspire us, that you would move our hearts, that you would fill our church with zest and with spirit for the same enterprise. We give so much to the community around us in a variety of ways. Help us to give the most precious gift of all, which is faith. Inspire our church, our leaders, our laity, and our staff. 
and us as individuals, each one. Open our eyes that we might see opportunities and people who are genuinely walking alone in this life. Father, give us the privilege of accompanying them until your son can be constant presence in their lives. We give thanks and praise and glory and honor for all that you've given us to do, and we can't wait to see what comes next. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Will you rise to uh, sing the closing song?